I've gotten a thumbs up. So we're going to go ahead and get started. But welcome to everyone. Welcome to the, the Brock Environmental Center. And what a beautiful day uh, this is. As I'd like to say in, in 757, it is uh, good for me to be back home. Uh, but to those of you that are visiting from other parts of Virginia and also other states, uh, welcome to Virginia Beach and, and Virginia. It is great to see our students uh, with us today. Uh, we had a great tour. Uh, this morning uh, out on the river, uh, learning about a lot of things that the climate change uh, affects, uh, sea level rise. We saw a lot of the, of the species that are, are natural inhabitants of, of the Chesapeake Bay and, and estuaries. And, and the story was told, and we listened to it, uh, about the balance between our economy and the environment. And, and you can have both. And when one is out of balance, it, it affects the whole situation. So, so to all the students, this is about your future. Um, we are our policymakers now, but certainly to have your input and your vision uh, is very, very helpful to us. I, I want to recognize a, a special friend of mine, uh, if, if I could. Uh, we're here at the Brock Environmental Center. Uh, I will make the point that this could have been developed. It could have been condominiums and, and homes out here, uh, but uh, she and her husband uh, had the vision to, to do otherwise and to, to turn this uh, into the greenest uh, building, uh, probably in Virginia, perhaps on the East Coast, uh, a building uh, that, that houses the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and Lynn Haven River now, and a, and a building that really helps to educate uh, young and old. And so, uh, Ms. Joan Brock, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you so much. For we also have uh, Delegate Nancy Guy, who represents this area. Nancy, thank you for joining us. Today. See uh, with me uh, Governor Hogan, and I'm going to say a few words about uh, Governor Hogan and, and our relationship over the years uh, uh, in just a little bit. But uh, certainly, thank you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule and, and to all the other individuals that are have made the trip here today. I know it is a very busy time. Delegate David Bulova, who uh, hails from Fairfax County and uh, Fairfax City. David, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you for joining us from the EPA, and we'll look forward to all of your comments uh, in, in just a bit. Uh, and also, uh, welcome to our Bay Shed partners from the District of Columbia, from Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and West Virginia. We've come together at the greenest building in Virginia and across the region, the Brock Environmental Center. From day one, our administration has made restoring the Chesapeake Bay and its living resources a top priority. And I will uh, just say that this is personal for me. Uh, I grew up over on the Eastern Shore, as a lot of you know, the Chesapeake Bay was literally my backyard. Um, I have lived, enjoyed the quality of life on the Bay, and I've also worked on the Bay. And I just, on behalf of Virginia and all the other states that are, are uh, <coughs> part of the Chesapeake Bay. I just thank you for your collaboration. Um, I watched the demise of the bay uh, as I was growing up. And, and now because of all of your efforts, uh, the bay is in so much better shape. We obviously still have work to do, but I, I, I just wanted to, to thank all of you. And, and just to say that a clean bay is vital to our environment. And it's also critical to our economy. When we do it right, sustainably supporting tourism, watermen and other industries uh, and and nobody uh, needs to be told this but it literally contributes billions, <coughs> billions of dollars to our economy each year that's how important a healthy Chesapeake Bay is we have created and we are following a sound science-based cleanup plan and we've made record investments in clean water and air practices and programs but we have more to do Without aggressive action to combat climate change, our goal of a healthy bay is under threat. With rising temperatures and seas and more rain that is more intense, we risk increased pollution, the loss of natural protective habitats like wetlands and buffers, and threats to public health and safety. <laughs> we also know that the effects of our warming 
planet are not experienced equal by everyone. More often, it's our low-income communities, both rural and urban, that are disproportionately harmed. They have higher temperatures, more flooding, and more exposure to harmful pollutants. That's why today's Chesapeake Bay Executive Council decision to commit to collective action for climate change is critically important and it is long overdue. This directive should leave no doubt that this Executive Council acknowledges that climate change presents a severe threat to the investments we have made in restoring our Chesapeake Bay and that urgent <clears throat> action is required. We will use the best climate science to chart a path forward. Our work will identify socioeconomic inequities and build equity into our Bay protection efforts. We will protect our green infrastructure, such as wetlands and buffers, and prioritize cost-effective nature-based solutions for building resilience to climate change. Investments in nature-based solutions, trees, oyster reefs, and living shorelines, for example, meet the goals of bay restoration, clean water, and climate resilience. In Virginia, we are already putting this climate directive to work. I directed our Department of Conservation and Recreation to prioritize low-income communities and green infrastructure investments through our Community Flood Preparedness Fund. Launched in June and supported through the sale of carbon credits, this fund is providing tens of millions of dollars to support local governments as they fight the environmental, and economic, and public safety threats of climate change. This directive from the council will help communities in all of our states. Local economies, such as the oyster aquaculture industry here on the Lynn Haven River, will grow and flourish with cleaner, healthier waters. As we discussed earlier today with Ms. Black, with minorities in aquaculture. We must also work to break down barriers for people of color, particularly women of color, to engage in our Bay economy. The Lynn Haven River stands as an example of what our Bay partnership can do to restore water and air quality and rebuild a local economic engine. And the health of the Chesapeake Bay is central to our efforts to expand opportunities for outdoor recreation throughout the region. Given the both the economic and environmental uh, importance of the Bay and its fisheries, uh, Maryland is pleased to work with all of our Bay partners, uh, particularly with Virginia, in managing our fisheries based on the best science available. Under the Chesapeake Bay Agreement, uh, Maryland and Virginia are committed to each restoring uh, five uh, large-scale oyster sanctuaries by 2025 for a total of 10. I was out on the boat earlier and understand that Derek Jack is up to six. <laughs> so so uh, it sounds like we got to get back to work. But so far, we've completed three of them in Maryland, and construction is, uh, is uh, on, on the remaining two is beginning right now. So we're very excited to be partnering in this regard. Uh, with the model that oysters provide, uh, Maryland is... Uh, also now turning our attention to the similar natural filter role that freshwater mussels play uh, and how they could offset pollution from the Susquehanna River and the Conolingo Dam. Comprehensive solutions to the Conolingo Dam problem continue, it's not a dam problem, it's a dam. <laughs> uh, continue to be a major uh, priority of my administration. Uh, and this includes finding innovative ways to address the increased nutrient and sediment pollution coming over the dam uh, from upstream, as well as solutions for the dam's impacts on our communities, our fisheries, and for the problem of trash and debris that flows over the dam every time there's a storm. Maryland really truly values the Bay Partnership collaboration in finalizing the kind of Lingo watershed implementation plan and by working on innovative financing solutions, uh, but more action and more federal support is needed to save the Susquehanna River and to restore the Chesapeake Bay. Maryland is working to provide uh, better sediment characterization data uh, from the Conolingo Reservoir, which will help inform how strategic dredging 
Uh, dredge material can be a game changer with the evolution in new uses and markets for recycled dredge materials. Back today, we have contractors positioned at Conway Dam, but dredging scheduled to begin tomorrow. Uh, now we need the EPA uh, to step up and help us bring the litigation chapter to a close with a strong commitment to increasing accountability and funding. Finally today, uh, while we have worked hard to make Maryland a national leader on climate change and environmental stewardship, we're committed to building on that legacy. So today, um, I'm submitting a memorandum uh, to Maryland legislative leaders, which lays out four key principles to guide further action on environmental reforms. It calls for number one, uh, stronger public-private funding mechanisms to increase investment in bay restoration. Two, a forward-thinking clean energy package. Uh, three, expanding land conservation and preservation. And four, an equitable transition to a cleaner and greener economy. Wonderful. These challenges are too important to lose this opportunity to take immediate action. And I look forward to working in a bipartisan way with our legislator, legislature and with all of you uh, to continue to grow our green economy, to restore the bay, and to address climate change. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you, Governor Hogan, and all of your staff. It's uh, been a pleasure to be able to spend the day with you, and let me just say how refreshing it is to see the rapport uh, between you and Governor Northam. Um, it, it's, it's, it is refreshing, um, and I, I think it harkens well for making even more progress towards restoring the Chesapeake Bay. And thank you, Governor Northam, uh, for selecting this fantastic site uh, for, uh, for this uh, signing today. Uh, it's a beautiful location, but I think more importantly, thank you for your leadership as chair of the executive council for, for this year. Um, I also want to say thank you for the water pun as part of the introduction. Yeah, uh, it was a watershed moment for me. <laughs> demonstrates that our governor can go with the flow. <laughs> but but it, has, it has been a privilege uh, to be able to work with you uh, in the General Assembly. Uh, as well as you and uh, our excellent First Lady, uh, Pam Northam, uh, during your governorship. Uh, I know Pam uh, has been instrumental in moving early childhood education forward, as, as well as environmental literacy. And it was fantastic last year that we were actually able to get funding for two dedicated staff uh, to help coordinate our environmental, environmental literacy efforts statewide. And so that was in large part because of your efforts. So thank you very, very much for, for doing that. Um, I can uh, uh, absolutely attest to the passion that you share for the Chesapeake Bay, uh, as well as the people that it sustains. But I think more importantly, and to kind of build off the theme that we've heard today, a, a keen understanding of that nexus between environmental stewardship and a strong economy. Um, and the fact they are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are one of the same. You can't have one without the other. Um, I also want to express my gratitude uh, to my fellow executive council members, and especially their staff, uh, with whom we could not uh, have made as much progress as we have over this year and the last couple of years, and to the many organizations and individuals that helped drive the Chesapeake Bay restoration effort uh, on behalf of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, I want to thank you for your support, your time, uh, your investments, your patience, uh, and when necessary, uh, your sometimes gentle prodding to make sure that we keep on, on the right track. Um, but the Bay Partnership, I think we can all ex see, extends well beyond that organizational structure that you see on a piece of paper. And I think ultimately that's what makes us so very powerful and gives me uh, the, the realization that we will succeed in our mission to restore the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the positive results uh, that we are making uh, are very clear, uh, and that is something to celebrate. And, and uh, nowhere have I seen that quite more on display uh, than what we've seen today, both in terms of the natural resources, uh, but also the human capital and the students that we have uh, that's being put towards this fantastic effort. So wonderful job to all of our students. Um, the thing is, is that just as clear as it is that we have um, made a lot of progress, uh, we also look down the road and you can see those challenges ahead. 
Um, the good thing, and I think uh, it's, it's really being demonstrated in the climate directive that we're going to be signing today, is that we not only recognize these challenges, it's easy to go ahead and recognize those challenges, but also that we have the strength and the fortitude and the willpower to actually tackle these challenges head on. So today I have the privilege of, of joining you as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates representing the city of Fairfax and Fairfax County, um, and also as the current chair of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Um, Chesapeake Bay Commission, as many as you may know, but you might not know, is, is the only um, organization uh, on the council that represents the legislative bodies, the legislative branch. And we've actually been a part of this executive council since its very inception. We have 21 just fantastic members uh, that represent Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania. And when we go to those meetings, uh, we take off the partisan hats and we work really hard to make sure that we are understanding the science behind the Bay Restoration. And then more importantly, putting that science into good policy so that we can actually make uh, and achieve uh, measurable results. I don't think that I am uh, spilling any state secrets by saying that the lens of a legislator uh, sometimes can be a little different than the lens or perspective of an executive branch. We like to think of ourselves as uh, value added. Um, I heard that uh, described in much more colorful terms um, by executives um, when we try to go ahead and add that value uh, during the legislative process. Uh, but in truth, uh, we have made great strides um, over the last 40 years uh, because of that wonderful web of policies. Um, some of it's regulatory, sometimes it's incentive based. Sometimes, uh, and I see people in this audience, it's just the sheer willpower of individuals who really want to make a difference. But ultimately, that progress is going to rely on sound laws and it's going to require um, sound, sustainable, adequate budgets in order to be able to carry that out. And so therein lies the critical role of, of the legislators. Um, the kind of directive we're signing today is, is really the latest example of the importance of this partnership. And I think as uh, Governor Hogan went ahead and mentioned, it's really that collective action that allows us to be able to have access to the best science possible. That science allows us to understand and mitigate those impacts to climate change. And then with that knowledge, we can go ahead and focus and prioritize our resources towards the most vulnerable communities uh, among our states. Um, as the chair of the commission this year, I really challenged uh, our own members. I challenged our staff to kind of reflect on our commitments and what is our role in the larger partnership. And not surprisingly, the thing that really bubbled to the surface were two things. One was making sure that we had the financial resources um, at all levels of, of government, but especially in the areas um, that we are focused on at the state and uh, at the federal levels. And then also our, our work on agriculture. And these are topics that the commission has worked on in partnership with you all for, for many, many years um, in terms of our engagement. Um, I am excited that out of kind of that, that conversation um, that we are, are pushing again with our partners, um, something called um, the Chesapeake Resilient Farms Initiative, uh, which would be housed if enacted with the United States Department of Agriculture. And what I'm delighted is that this really seems to have resonated uh, among our partners and they've rallied around this effort. Um, the idea is that we really need to make sure that our farmers um, have the resources they need through enhanced funding, enhanced technical assistance, in order to be able to implement best management practices on the ground and importantly so, ones that will stand the test of time with our changing climate. We can certainly take great, great pride um, in our agricultural producers within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. They have been a national model uh, as far as leaders in implementing conservation practices. But I think what is so critical is we all recognize that the Chesapeake Bay uh, TMDL deadline is now four years away, right? And there's still a lot more to be done. And with the agriculture sector in particular, uh, 80 percent of those reductions need to come from agriculture. Um, fortunately, we have a very receptive audience within the agricultural community, and we have a lot of individuals who, with just a little bit of cost share of money, recognize that this is good for their, uh, for the environment, but it's also good for their businesses. Um, what we lack, however, is the capacity, and that's both human and also financial. 
And that is the core of what this Chesapeake Resilient Farms Initiative will address, is those shortcomings and allowing us to have the adequate resources so that we can put in not just practices, but practices that are focused in the areas where they will make the most difference. It's worth noting, we did a study in Virginia recently that found that agricultural BMPs implemented for water quality actually had the secondary benefit of sequestering carbon in the amount of 400,000 metric tons per year. That is a true win-win. And so in closing, I just want to say thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this absolutely fantastic movement. And I wanted to give a special shout out uh, to the citizens of the watershed. Um, and it's only going to be through their individual actions, through their understanding, through their commitment that is ultimately going to create the success that is going to leave such a fantastic legacy for future generations to look back on pride. And so now I would like to turn over the mic to Diana Escher, the Acting Regional Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. Very much and good afternoon everyone. I want to thank Governor Northam and First Lady for providing this great experience for us to firsthand get out on the bay. I really enjoyed it um, in particularly interacting with the students and I see a number of them sitting in that back room and it reminded me of one of my first experiences uh, in working with the Chesapeake Bay program. So back in 1999, quite a long time ago, I became the deputy director for EPA's Chesapeake Bay program. And my first speaking engagement was for a group of students. And I really didn't know much about the Bay at that point. Um, and someone wrote me beautiful talking points, three pages, single space talking points. And I tried to memorize them. So I got up in front of these students at a podium and I looked out and panicked. I forgot everything. I forgot what SAV was. I forgot what the states in the Bay Watershed, you know, what, what were they? And the words were swimming. So I, I kind of stood there and I was trying to figure out how to move forward. And I remembered that I had a package of candy bars for my kids in my pack. And I pulled them out and I said, who did knows what the SAV is <laughs> and, and students shot their hands off and I said what about you and somebody said submerged aquatic vegetation underwater grasses and I threw candy bar. so from there on I just asked questions the students saved me yeah. and uh, I was able to move on I will not ask you to save me today. Um, I think I can read my talking point and I did three candy bars. So I, I just want to say I'm really excited uh, to be here. I'm so glad that EPA can be a part of this climate change directive. And with the Executive Council signing of the climate change directive, we're really joining hands to counter a force that threatens our very way of life and the progress we've worked so hard to achieve. So I, I do want to put a special thanks out to Ann Jennings for heading up the committee. That, that yeah. The Biden-Harris administration, the federal government through its departments and the agencies are going to do everything they can to help implement the climate change directive. We are coming together to form an action plan. So EPA is working with its federal partners and we're putting together a set of actions in line with the directive to demonstrate our strong commitment to restoring the watershed. The directive meets the intent of this administration's executive actions and orders to tackle climate crisis at home and abroad, to protect public health and the environment, to secure environmental justice, and to restore science to our process. One thing that EPA is really happy to see. acknowledges the science and consequences of climate change for the Chesapeake Bay region, including the disproportionate impacts on vulnerable and disadvantaged populations in both urban and rural areas. Our message is very clear today. Urgent attention is needed to counter the impacts of climate change on the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The good news is that we have a head start. Indeed, our actions today support the partnership's long-standing involvement in protecting and conserving lands that make this region 
more resilient. We know that the health of the Bay and the welfare of the 18 million people who live in this watershed go hand in hand. And that's one of the things the students talked about, really appreciate that group who talked about the economy and the environment and reminded us of the Lorax story. We're committed to this mission and we're committed to building on the strong productive relationships with our states, local and tribal partners who know their communities far better than the federal government does. So EPA will continue to adapt our needs to the, to, will continue to adapt to the needs of our partners to support the 2025 goals and fulfill our shared vision of protecting the Chesapeake Bay for generations to come, along with the people and the economies that rely on its vitality. So now it's time to complete our action on the climate change directive. Administrator Regan was pleased to have signed the directive along with other EC members prior to this meeting. And I'm gonna turn it over to Delegate Bolivar to start the slide. I believe it's, it's okay. We'll take some questions uh, from the press if you all have any. Look at me. Yes, uh, wait, 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 hold on. Sorry. Not sure if this is. Yeah. It's on. Okay. Yes, I have your name. Okay. All right. Uh, Brett Hall, AB10. So I guess they're picking up on the stream. Anyway. Uh, so today, well, the new FEMA flood rates came out. Now, Virginia has more uh, increases likely according to the FEMA than Maryland. But it says mitigations will help, and obviously that's that's part of. It sounds like what this is about. Is that is that is that why it's so important to do this? Because this is these FEMA rates are going to affect a lot of homeowners. Absolutely, Brett, and I appreciate the question. And I think, as most people know, you know, Hampton Roads is second only to uh, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans area for sea level rise, and uh, it's something that. Uh, we've been aware of for a number of years, but uh, we, we need to, uh, I think, make it a, a, a top priority now uh, as, as we move forward. And, and just to, to mention uh, Virginia, and I'll, I'll let Governor Hogan speak to, you know, because I know they're involved in some of the same things we are, but you know, we need to put less carbon into the air. And, and that means we need to move toward renewable energy. Um, and we're very proud. We've, we've got a lot of solar farms uh, that are in place and that we're developing across Virginia, but something right here in Hampton Roads that we're so excited about is, is offshore wind. And as you know, we have two uh, offshore turbines. Uh, we plan to have about 190 more. Um, we're using the Port of Virginia, uh, not only to, to construct those, but to, or, or to put them together, but to, to manufacture them and, and take them out off of our coast. And uh, and hopefully be leaders uh, up and down the, the East Coast. So, you know, anything that we can do to, to work together to put less carbon uh, into the air, uh, it will certainly help with, with flooding, sea level rise, climate change, you know, all of those topics are, are very important. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I would agree with uh, everything you just said and uh, all the things that I talked about in my opening remarks are the reasons why this agreement is so important and it's certainly one of the issues, but we've got so many issues that we've got to deal with both uh, with respect to climate change, with clean air and clean water. I just think it's, uh, again, I'll reiterate that it's just wonderful that all of the states are working together with the federal partners to try to address these issues. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to take you right next, Jeremy. Um, I just want to remind folks that are listening on the webcast, you can type in questions if you have them on online, we'll take them as well. So, but Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Cox with the Chesapeake Bay Journal. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So as was mentioned earlier, we have four years left uh, to meet the 2014 uh, Bay Watershed Agreement uh, commitments. And an internal uh, review earlier this year said that at least uh, six key commitments were 
unlikely to be achieved by that time, including essential one related to nutrients and sediment pollution. So what, what is the game plan uh, to close those gaps? Uh, is there urgency to do so? And if it's out of reach, when are you gonna tell the public? Yeah, Jeremy, thank you for the question. And the first thing I would say, nothing is out of reach, uh, especially when, when everybody realizes that that's a challenge and, and, and also uh, works to, together. So and I think uh, Delegate Bulova, you know, I think mentioned something that's really important uh, and that is to, to work with all of the sources of pollutants that are going into uh, the Chesapeake Bay and, and having grown up on a farm, uh, I'm aware that uh, agriculture, which is by the way, our number one industry in Virginia, uh, is has stepped up and will continue to need to step up. We also uh, need to work with developers. Uh, we need to make sure that we have impervious uh, of grounding, uh, for example, that, that we have uh, less runoff uh, that's going into the, the estuaries. We, we just learned today about living shorelines. Uh, a lot of beautiful homes uh, line uh, the Lynn Haven River and, and, and other estuaries. And, and we need the, the water, the runoff that's coming from our, our land, such as our, our um, uh, places where people uh, reside, that, that that's a part of the, uh, the pro process going forward. And, and uh, you know, even things, Jeremy, like picking up behind our, our animals. I mean, if, 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 you know, if you add all these things up collectively, we know that we're putting too many uh, pollutants into the Chesapeake Bay. And so while our, our deadline is in 2025, um, we have a lot of work to do. Obviously, uh, climate change is a, a challenge on top of that. But, you know, that's why we're here today. Uh, that's why we're, we're working together. Um, and I appreciate all of the, the state leaders and, and all of the private uh, industry advocates. Uh, it's, a, it's a team effort. And so, uh, you know, we, we're not gonna give up. Um, and the last thing I would say is that it is great seeing the students here because at some point, uh, we're obviously doing this not only for our generation, but future generations. And, and um, we're gonna need to hand the baton off uh, uh, at some point and to have you all involved, educated, uh, to know what the priorities are is, is just key. So, uh, we'll, Jeremy, we'll keep moving forward and we'll keep making progress. Catherine Hacker with the Virginia Pilot. Um, with this new climate change directive, how big of a shift do you see that being in terms of on the ground restoration efforts and how will you gauge success moving forward? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And, you know, as a lot of uh, directives and executive orders and uh, however you want to describe them, uh, I think they're just a sign to, for us to say uh, as leaders that, that we're committed. Um, and that's certainly the purpose of this. Um, it, it says that, that we're committed moving forward. Um, it also is, is used as an education tool. Uh, and I appreciate all of you from the media being here. Uh, it's not just important for us to realize about the importance of what we're doing, but it's important for everybody uh, that uh, is, is part of the Chesapeake Bay, that's part of Virginia, that's part of the six states in the District of Columbia, uh, to know that they need to be part of the solution. And so that's the purpose of this executive directive. All right, we have time for one more question. Brett, we have guests here, so we, we need to include everybody. Oh, well, I was gonna, I was gonna make a reference to some the delegates. Okay. <laughs> good, good. Yes. I'm off the hook. Oh no, you're not. <laughs> so I grew up just uh, uh, a few miles from the uh, Conewingo Dam, and uh, know the issues there that you're talking about. And you were talking about the agriculture community uh, listening, but I think it knows, and the governor of Maryland probably knows. It's a population a little north of the Mason-Dixon line that is one of the big issues. Uh, farmers that are more off the grid, I'll say. And uh, is, there, is there positive uh, feedback coming off uh, trying to, to, to deal with that? I mean, I know that's one of the biggest problems coming down the Susquehanna. I'm sure that all affects everyone one here. How is, how is that moving forward? Well, I'll, uh, I'll try to tackle that one. First of all, you're, you're right. Uh, Obviously, I, I talk about that in my opening remarks that the, the uh, sediment and the nutrients and the pollution coming down the Susquehanna over the Tonawingo Dam and into the bay is a serious problem. It obviously comes from upstream. Uh, and we, uh, we have been working with all of our uh, partners here to try to make more progress. And I, I mentioned that we'd like to have uh, more help from the, you know, we actually filed suit on this issue. Uh, not that we wanted to 
you know, get into a dispute with any of our neighbors. We want to try to encourage collaboration. We're hoping that maybe the EPA can help with some of the funding. We understand it's uh, difficult uh, actions and decisions for upstream neighbors, uh, but we want to figure out a way to move forward. Uh, you know, we've we've uh, made it a top priority for us. We record funding, record funded every environmental and Chesapeake Bay restoration program for seven years in a row. I think we put about $8 billion in the cleaning up the bay and phase the cleanest it's been in a generation. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. And there's no question that Susquehanna is one of the major issues that needs to be addressed. And if I could just go ahead and add in there, um, there, 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 is, there is an urgency and I think there is a recognition and a commitment on all of the partners to have uh, to be able to, to make this work. I, I will tell you that the federal infrastructure bill does present a once in a generation opportunity in order to really push this initiative forward. And so that's that Chesapeake uh, Resilient Farms Initiative. And um, what, what we found about agriculture and farmers is, um, you know, they, they, they understand they want to be out there um, supporting our environment, but they also have to make business decisions. And so that really is kind of the heart of our voluntary cost share program is providing the kind of support and resources necessary in order for agriculture to be able to really step it up. Uh, it comes down to a matter of, of funding. Um, and so for a lot of these uh, programs, they are oversubscribed. We know that if we put the resources in it, we put them in at the right places, uh, that indeed uh, the agricultural community will step up to the plate. And so those are the kind of things that we're working on right now um, among our state and our federal partners. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Well, thank you all for, for being here today. It's a, a beautiful day, and I, I don't have to remind anybody uh, that this Chesapeake Bay is, is truly a treasure. Um, it's a gem, and uh, it provides so much for our quality of life. It's, you know, why people want to come uh, to this area and other states that are surrounding the Chesapeake Bay, and it, it's also a, a, such a large part of our economy. And, and so we realize that uh, we've made a lot of progress, and I want to say thank you to all of you that uh, have worked on that progress, but we still have challenges ahead. We still have a lot of work to do. We know that climate change is, is, a, is a challenge as well. Uh, and so I just, uh, my message to all of you on, on behalf of us is to keep up the good work um, and don't be discouraged. And I, I can promise you that the end product, uh, that being a, a healthy, vibrant Chesapeake Bay that's not just there for our generation, but there for future generations, that really should be all of our goals. So let's keep up the good work. And uh, in the meantime, I, I want to thank the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for hosting us today. It is great being at the Brock Environmental Center. Go ahead. Work and you all have a, uh, a good weekend. Thank you all so much. Yeah.